So thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here today. And I think I'm one of the few repeat speakers from last year. And so I'll start out uh, with a question from last year. And uh, uh, this is work. Uh, I'll, at the end of the talk, I will highlight some of the, just a few of the highlights going on in, that's actually funded by the Center for Energy Efficient Materials under the nice, great support from DOE. Uh, much of the work that goes on in lighting at UCSB is in a center that's uh, entirely industrially supported called the Solid State Lighting and Energy Center that's led by Steve Denbars and Suji Nakamura. And with Umesh Mishra, Steve, Suji, and I have worked together in a barrier-free collaboration for about 18 years, and Suji came on board over 11 years ago. So that's really the, the core of our activity in nitrides. So in the outline, I'm just going to give you a brief primer on light and lighting. This comes back to a question from last year, and then talk about the impact of solid-state lighting on the energy equation, uh, a little bit about the technology and economics of solid-state lighting, and then just a little bit of highlights of UCSB efforts in solid-state lighting. And the goal of this, of course, is right now in, in the lighting age is that we're somewhere between incandescent lights and various forms of uh, compact fluorescent lighting. The goal uh, in our lighting center is to end the last tube technology. Uh, this is just a housing on an early manifestation of an Edison socket replacement light bulb, but there's no tube in this. And so this is the last tube technology, and the goal in our center is actually to kill this tube. The big issue in killing the tube, this last tube technology, is actually economic now because all the other pieces are largely in place. And so first, uh, this was a question last year and this sort of troubled me because it's a little bit of a complicated definition. So uh, what is light and how do we define it? And so I know this is a little bit confusing. Uh, this goes back to archaic units that are tied to a candle. A candle uh, is a very very poor form of illumination. How do you make a candle? You take a piece of string, right? It's soaked and waxed, and then the wax will wet up that stream. It will vaporize the carbon, and then you actually have luminescence from carbon black. That's a candle. A candle gives off very little light, right? And then the units of a candle go back to something on the order of furlongs. It's something like the light intensity that your eye would see at one foot from a standard candle. So this is an archaic unit. It's amazing that it survived as becoming an SI unit. <laughs> it's amazing. And so we had a question last year, what's a lumen? So I have to explain what a candle is first, and then we'll go to a lumen. And so the can candela is a unit. It's a luminous intensity approximately from one candle. Okay. Um, this includes what's called the radiate intensity. This is properly an SI unit. So this would be in watts uh, per, per solid angle. Okay. And then the luminous intensity includes the human eye response. And as I'll show you in a moment, the human eye sees the best at pure green, OK? And as that we go to longer wavelengths toward the red or IR, we see less and less efficiently. And the same if we go to higher energies, shorter wavelengths towards the violet, we see less and less light. And by the time light has a wavelength much less than 400 nanometers, we can barely see anything at all, OK? So the Luminous intensity includes a, a function that goes back to these archaic uh, issues of the candle times the human eye response, which is normalized to one at, at true green light, times the radiant intensity, which is in proper SI units. And then the lumen, which is what we call luminous flux, and this is usually what you buy when you buy lighting, okay, is just the luminous intensity times solid angle. So a candle, a simple table candle, for example, gives off four pi stair radians, and so that's a solid angle of a sphere, okay, times one, approximately one, candle, one candela, so about 12 lumens, and a 100 watt light bulb, and this is the important number that everybody can sort of wrap their minds around, a 100 watt light bulb gives off approximately 1,000 lumens, okay? And if you go to Home Depot today, you can easily buy a 100 watt light bulb if you buy it in a pack for something well south of a buck, right? And so that's an important number, because in your mind, you want a lighting pro product that's about a kilolumen for something south of a buck. Okay. Now, if you're eco-conscious and also can do the arithmetic on lifetime, you may fall to the temptation to buy something much better in efficiency, which is a compact fluorescent light, okay, for a subsidized price somewhere between two and five bucks. Right? And that's giving out something on the order of it. And then if you go to Home Depot today, you will actually see a section on the shelf of solid state lighting products. And it looks great until you look at the price tag and you see something on the order of 50 bucks. And it's not 1,000 lumens. It's probably half of that. 
That's the big challenge. There are many other technical challenges, but those are the real challenges. Okay? So we talked about this. This is the human eye response. This is called the eye response function uh, as a function of wavelength. Everything that we do in lighting is between violet and red. Uh, what Professor Bowers talked about in his very nice talk on optical communications is typically done at about twice this wavelength, either at 1330 nanometers or 1550 nanometers, okay, out in the IR. Uh, where we make LEDs primarily is with blue LEDs with a gallium nitride material system. We can also make pretty good but not great green LEDs. And as we go to longer wavelengths in the nitride systems, we struggle. But coming from the conventional 3.5 materials, arsenides and phosphides that we heard a little bit about earlier this morning, can make extremely good LEDs but not so good orange or yellow LEDs. And so I'll talk about this a little bit, okay? So making really good devices in the green is a real dream of us long term because this is by far where there's the highest efficiency. And this is what's called the luminous efficacy, fundamentally, that if we had a perfectly efficient light source in lumens per watt, that in the green, it's on the order of 680 lumens per watt and quickly falls off in efficacy as we go in either direction. This is because of the human eye response, okay? And then a little bit more on light, okay? This is what's referred to the CIE diagram. And this is a little bit of a complicated concept, but this is how to take something linear, which is just wavelength, and wrap it around to capture how the human eye perceives light, okay? And so if we take light here, for example, which is violet blue, and if we were to combine it with yellow light here, and with the right color mixing to the human eye, combining two different colors would appear to be white. And this is the basic game that we play in solid state lighting. And if we look at the possible efficiencies here, and I'll compare these in a moment to the efficiencies of existing light sources, okay? These are the fundamental theoretical efficiencies. And anything on this locus here, so you see these are all contour lines of efficiencies, okay? For different light sources, okay? The highest possible efficiency is in the green, which is on the order of 680 lumens per watt. If we go along this locus, which is referred to the Planckian locus, this is what white light would appear to be. And this white light along this locus appears to be colder and colder as the color temperature goes up. I know that's counterintuitive, but higher and higher color, higher and higher temperature flames that go from being a dull orange to a bright red to a blue to an incredibly bright white. That's the black body radiation from the luminescing particles, okay? And so ideally, uh, the ideal light source would have a color temperature of about 2,700 degrees Kelvin. That's the color temperature of an incandescent light bulb, and that's what you're familiar with, okay? That's what we call warm white light, okay? If we have higher color temperatures where the efficiencies are uh, around here, which would be around 5,000 degrees Kelvin, okay, that's what we call cold light, okay? And that's what you would see in a typical poor quality fluorescent light bulb. It looks sort of bluish. It has a cold feel to it, okay? And so... This is a space that we work in in solid state lighting. The typical way that we do this is that we take a blue LED and we combine it with phosphors such that we land on the Planckian locus so that we have high quality light that looks like black body radiation from light. Okay? And these are just comparison of conventional light sources. Uh, really, no perfect artificial light source exists yet. In terms of color quality, probably by far the highest quality, color quality light sources are incandescent light sources. Uh, the, the advantages of incandescent light bulbs uh, is it, it's a great product. It's very cheap. It has great color quality. Lifetimes are typically very short, a, a thousand, a few thousand hours. And as we'll show in a moment, very poor efficiency. Uh, fluorescent light bulbs are sort of the next candidate for, for general illumination in terms of uh, light, okay? Uh, typically, fluorescent light bulbs have cold color temperature, okay? Intermediate efficiency, intermediate lifetime, and is a concern of ours in the long term is that uh, even a simple CFL has something on the order of five milligrams of mercury in it, okay? And so this is a, also a, a life safety issue. Uh, halogen lights are a fantastic point source of light, very short lifetime, very poor efficiency. And then for outdoor lighting, uh, high intensity discharge lights are quite popular. Major issues with high intensity discharge is, is that they typically have very, very poor color quality, actually very difficult restart and start issues and very short lifetimes. So somebody asked me, what's the sequence of lighting that solid state lighting will knock off, okay, in terms of markets? For illumination, the first thing is it probably will happen will be halogen, okay, because of the specific properties of LEDs. 
And then I think it will be a tie between knocking off either incandescent or different manifestations of fluorescent. Okay? And then for outdoor lighting, uh, this is already starting to happen in terms of knocking off high intensity discharge okay? because of the light quality and because of the very, very life, long lifetime of LED-based lights. If you go again to Home Depot today, you will be able to find very expensive, very early generation solid state lighting replacements. Okay? These are just examples maybe of a year back of Philips light bulbs. Okay? The efficiency of these is okay. okay? It's not great. The total light output of these, if you see here, these, these early generation solid state light bulbs, these are on the order of 200 to 300 lumens. They're about a one third where they need to be. They have real issues with the overall design. So in terms of the engineering and the efficiency and the cost, this is the space that the whole industry is working on so that we have something in these two examples of a Edison socket replacement, conventional light bulb has to improve dramatically in terms of engineering. Uh, we have a little bit more space uh, replacing directional uh, halogen lighting. Okay? So coming to efficiency, this is uh, fresh off of the press. This is from the uh, DOE solid state lighting multi-year plan. If you type into Google DOE and solid state lighting, it will directly take you to links. This multi-year plan is a beautiful report from DOE. This is the newest generation that was just published. Oh, it says March. It just came online live about a week ago. And so this shows the luminous efficacy in lumens per watt as a function of time. And if we start with these archaic technology, incandescent light bulbs have basically been flat ever since Edison at something between 10 and 20 uh, lumens per watt. And halogen light bulbs, slight improvements on these, but typically halogen light bulbs have luminous efficacies of about 20 lumens per watt. If we, please, Please save me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, it, and if we start comparing to the real competition, uh, we don't see these as competition. We just see this as cost. Uh, fluorescent light bulbs, CFLs are typically at efficiency of about 60 lumens per watt with not any reason to improve dramatically. Uh, linear fluorescents typically have efficiencies on the order of 80 lumens per watt. If we look at the evolution in solid state lighting, this is real product efficiencies, but lab demonstrations in solid state lighting, the record lab demonstration for white light now is Nichia actually at 250 lumens per watt in a laboratory demonstration. Okay? And at theoretical limits, well north of 300 lumens per watt, we're optimistic that in time, with good engineering and science, we can get there. Okay? Uh, we think ultimately at 2020 timeframe that we should have fielded technologies easily of 150 lumens per watt, but really possibly well north of 200 lumens per watt. Uh, that's where the field's heading. This is uh, data that Danny Fiesel, who's a senior researcher in our Solid State Lighting and Energy Center, put together. Uh, this is a very interesting number. Uh, he spent quite a bit of time looking at electricity consumption in California, getting data from online. And what's very interesting in this data, this is the most aggressive number that I've actually seen on lighting consumption of electricity. In California, interior lighting uses 28.7% of electricity, and exterior lighting is about 6%. So electricity consumption due to lighting is on the order of 35% in California. This probably does not take into account the fact that lighting is actually a fairly good heat source, and that means that when we're in warmer times of the year, you're actually air conditioning to overcome the lighting. So there's actually additional air conditioning load due to lighting. Okay? which is actually a real issue in, in, in buildings. Okay? And so you see more conservative numbers on the energy impacts of solid state lighting. Uh, this is from uh, information from the DOE solid state lighting website. Uh, th th this is fresh data I, I just pulled off the web a couple days ago. But if you look at 2030, anticipated energy savings from solid state lighting with reasonable estimates of market penetration in 2030, I think these are conservative numbers at 150 lumens per watt. What you will find is that DOE estimates 190 terawatt hours of energy savings. So that's the equivalent of uh, 24 full gigawatt power plants. Almost all power plants are, are on the order of a gigawatt or about 31 tons of CO2. These conservative estimates are based on 20 to 25 percent energy consumption. So just to change gears a little bit, how do we make light uh, from LEDs? So the basic idea in LEDs, unlike the silicon that John was talking about, but the compound semiconductors that he was referring to, 
is that we have carriers which are positively charged called holes, and we inject these and have them meet electrons. So this is the absence of an electron, a hole, with electrons in a direct band gap semiconductor. If we do things properly, we can have a very high success rate of making light. And then if we really work hard, we can coax that light out of the high refractive index semiconductor. So the material systems that we work on are all direct band gap semiconductors spanning band gaps from the deep ultraviolet in the aluminum nitride material system to the near ultraviolet material system, gallium nitride, and to the fairly far into the infrared with indium nitride. And by alloying indium nitride with gallium nitride, we can span the band gap range and the visible, particularly from violet to blue towards green. And then the real structure of a light emitting diode looks like this. This is uh, uh, research supported under the uh, SEAM Center at UCSB. This is an atom probe tomograph. Uh, this is about a 100 million atom data set, actually looking at the atomic structure. So every little pixel, little, little pixel in here would be a single atom that we record sequentially in producing this. This is the P side of the semiconductor where we inject the holes. This is the N side of the semiconductor. And if we do this well in the material with the right energy band gap, so, so this produces the right radiation of light, and these are the indium gallium nitride quantum wells, this is where we actually produce the light that then we have to coax out of the semiconductor for the solid state lighting. Two main approaches for solid state lighting is to take different color LEDs and mix these to make white light. Uh, this has not gotten very much traction in the field uh, for two reasons. One, the green emitters are not sufficiently emission, efficient now. The blue emitters are very efficient. And actually, the drive electronics for this still looks difficult, okay, to get good color mixing uh, and, and combined with binning issues. Whereas the primary approach for making white light is to take a blue LED and combine it with a yellow phosphor or a yellow phosphor plus some other combinations of phosphors. And to the human eye, blue plus yellow looks white, okay? And this is the way that we do it, okay? And then the impact that this has already had in lighting, if we just look at market sizes for lighting, okay? And it's very interesting how technologies, unexpected technologies drive lighting. Uh, what really got gallium nitride based LEDs off the ground for technology was actually initially having keypad lights for cell phones. And then the screen on cell phones is actually illuminated with white gallium nitride LEDs. And until recently, this was the largest market for LEDs. And then you've seen this transformation. Almost all computer monitors, laptop monitors, have gone from what are called cold compact fluorescent light bulbs to LEDs along the side of it. And now TV sets, okay, which uh, are illuminated with what are called backlighting units. They're really side lighting units. And we call this the backlight unit market, BLU market, is actually driving this. Uh, right now, the total market uh, for high brightness LEDs is on the order of $20 billion. What we anticipate is about 2015, it's going to be the tipping point where the LED market is going to be driven by lighting. And it's about 2015 that in the marketplace, a year earlier or a year later, that one should actually be able to see reasonably priced LED-based lights. So that's the tipping point. And then the total available market for solid state lighting in 2020, we anticipate to be something on the order of 50 to $100 billion a year. I have seen market studies out of Wall Street where this number can be as high as 120 to $150 billion a year. So this would be by far the second largest semiconductor uh, application. Um, so I just want to talk about two other things very quickly. Um, so in solid state economics, this is our shun shot, and we also have a a sunshot, we haven't described it, but the solid state lighting targets for 2020 are actually out of DOE, and this is in the DOE multi-year plan. So I pulled this out of the DOE multi-year plan that just published, is to get to what's called an LED package price. So this is the light engine of, by 2020, to get to $1 per kilolumen. What you actually see in industry, and in industry targets, is to have the whole light engine at 50 cents that's producing 1,000 lumens. And then the whole electronics plus base plus luminaire plus package at 50 cents. So that combined, it's $1. So that at the retail level, it would be on the order of 3 to $5. And so that's our sunshot, OK? What's happening in the industry, um, what we're really finding in the industry is that as the industry is growing, of course, more people see that, see that it's interesting and want to get involved. But the other thing that we see is that more and more people are entering the industry from the silicon side. 
And then when people in industry enter from the silicon side, they actually understand how to scale cost, manufacturing, and that's driving it very hard now as it's, it's starting to run. So can I have one more minute? Two more minutes? OK. <laughs> OK. So let me just give you a couple examples of what we're doing at, <coughs> at UCSB. Uh, if somebody said, what's the biggest issue today in solid state lighting on the science and technology side, it's what's called efficiency droop. And what efficiency droop is, this, is a phenomena that if we look at the slope of the light output with, with drive current, it tends to roll over. So as we put more and more current into the LED, we're getting more light out, but less and less at a slower and slower rate. And so if we look at the efficiency as a function of drive current, we'll hit a peak efficiency at a very low drive current, and the LED will actually run less and less efficiently. And this gets worse and worse as we go to longer wavelengths. Uh, the leading theory of this is uh, a process called indirect Auger. Uh, Chris Vanderwall, uh, under SEAM support at UCSB, has just published a very important paper in APL. This just came out last week, where he's done fundamental um, density functional theory calculations of this three-body process. So these are actually very challenging calculations, and actually predicted fundamentally that a phonon-assisted, or what's called indirect Auger, is the cause of droop. Claude Weisbuck and I have experiments underway to see if we can get a direct experimental signature if indeed this indirect Auger process is a cause of droop. Droop is a major issue because as we drive the diodes harder and harder, they become less efficient. So the solution to have them efficient is to use a lot of area, and then the cost goes up. If we can solve droop through design of our epi active region and new orientations, then we can get a real economic gain. This is a massive issue in solid state lighting. Another issue that, that was pioneered at UCSB uh, is new orientations of gallium nitride that we call nonpolar and semipolar. And we've already shown with our data at UCSB that we're able to fill this poor efficiency gap in the green region. And we're very optimistic with continued science and engineering that we can fill the green gap. And so uh, th this is another area we're looking at. In an area that's already in modern technology, if you go out and buy the high brightness LEDs from Cree or Philips LumaLED or Osram, what you would, and if you ripped it apart and looked at the emitting surface, you would find microcones. This microcone technology was developed by Suji Nakamura and Evelyn Hu in the early 2000s at UCSB. And thanks to the great support from Cheryl Mills Englander and her team at TIA, this is patented now, and this is the dominant technology for light extraction in high brightness LEDs. That's a UCSB invention. Uh, Claude Weisbuch and I and others are working very hard on photonic crystals, and our own data on photonic crystals is showing that we can get better light extraction from uh, gallium nitride-based photonic crystal LEDs over rough LEDs. That's all UCSB technology and IP. This is a new important paper uh, from Liz Rangel, who was supported under SEAM, that just came out in APL showing this improved directional light extraction from high-performance photonic crystal LEDs. So those things are really happening now at UCSB. And I think the main thing that I want to say in prospects is that our technologies have actually been driven by unexpected markets. The, the market that is surprisingly really giving a big boost to solid state lighting is backlight units for LCD TV. This is giving us a huge unexpected scaling in the industry. Uh, and again, because I know there are great talks this morning about the SunShot initiative in solar, uh, the lighting side of it, we have a sun shot, and that's to get to a buck for a kilolumen. Okay? When that happens, all lighting technology will be solid state lighting. Good. Thanks. <laughs>